All right, hello everyone, and welcome back to our fourth lecture on the workings of our legislative branch. Now, I know in the last two we split up uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate, um, where originally I would combine them. I'm not going to do that in this one. I'm actually going to keep sections four and five of chapter five together here, and we're going to talk about the various committees and agencies that exist or help out our legislative branch so let's hear let's uh get started all right so we're going to first talk about congressional committees and discuss what they actually do and what what their purpose is within um, our legislative branch so their purpose is um first off they're there to ease the workload and act as the power centers that are in place within our legislative branch um and how they how do they ease the workload well, they divide the work and specialize it according to the specific committee. So if you have bills that are on education, um, spending, or whatever, you're going to send that to the educational committee. If you have that um, bills that have to do with foreign relations, you're going to send them there and, and so forth. Um, so they, they do that. They also select the bills that are up for consideration accordingly um, to go along with that specialization and division and it gives it a place gives our, our congress a place to compromise on the various bills that are put in place whether they look at it and say okay let's add something here let's take this away let's combine it with another bill or what have you and then also these committees are a place for the public to have knowledge of the issues that are being talked about in our legislative branch and the reason why this is is because you can go on to the website of the Senate or, or the House of Representatives, and you can actually go into these committees and see what they're actually talking about. And this gives an avenue for us to, to have an understanding of what's going on. All right, so let's talk about real briefly the types of committees that are in place in our Congress. The first one is our first types of committees are standing committees. These are ones that are they're permanent. That's why it's called standing. They exist in both houses. So you would see this committee exist in House Representatives and the Senate. They're always controlled by the majority party, and it's the membership that's in that party is divided according to the, the actual House strength. So if you have a 60% controlled Democratic Party or Democratic controlled House Representatives, 60% of that standing committee would be Democrats. And if it was likewise, let's say you had a 60% controlled Senate that committee would be controlled uh, or be made up of 60% Republicans in that case. Um, we also have subcommittees, which are smaller, more specialized um, committees within standing committees or other groups that we're going to see later. Um, and these can be permanent or semi-permanent according to the issue that's at hand. All right, uh, three other types we have are select committees. Um, select committees are are meant to be temporary um, they are renewable if need be, just in case they don't get things done on that issue at that specific time. Um, and they study they study one specific issue. That's why they're called select committees. They selected this issue to talk about. Typically, these ones are dealing with organized crime, um, things like hunger, or like interest groups like small is small business owners or so forth are what these select committees deal with. Um, joint committees are committees that are made up of members from both the House of Representatives and the Senate together on that committee. Um, they can be permanent or temporary according to the issue that's at hand. In theory, the whole idea is that they're there to work together so that if work is getting done um, in one house and work's getting done in another, that they can actually coordinate it so it's much more effective. In practice, because of the differences between the two houses, as well as political differences, especially if one house is controlled by one party and the other house is controlled by the other, means they really only handle most routine matters um, together. Um, but there are instances where they have worked together um, quite a bit in the past. And then we have conference committees, which are very similar to joint committees, um, but typically what they're designed to do is if the houses are trying to pass a bill um, that's different because of where it started, but it deals with the same issue, their job is to actually resolve the difference so that those two bills make sense and you're, you're not um, passing laws that are going to conflict with each other. Um, or they're trying to get things done a lot more effectively and efficiently um, across the board in, in Congress. 
All right, so how do they choose members? Well, um, choosing members is really important if you're going to become a congressman or woman, um, or becoming, sorry, becoming a member of a committee, because it shows that you're trying to do, do things, um, and you can become an up-and-coming star through that way, um, because it not only helps you uh, increase your chance for re-election by getting your name out there, both within Congress, um, nationally, and, and with your people at home. Um, it gives you a, a better chance to influence policy making at the national level and get influence over other members. So that's a big thing for anybody in the House or the Senate to be a part of a committee. Now, the top committees that are um, a part of our Congress in the House are the Rules Committee, like we talked about earlier. You have the Ways and Means Committee and the Committee on Appropriations. And then in the Senate, you have Foreign Relations, Finance, and Appropriations. So you can see that these are the, the top issues or top um, areas that we deal with in terms of bills um, or actions become law or what's facing our country and what they want to deal with. It has to do with a lot of spending and where funding is going to go. All right, so the system itself, so assignment in how members are chosen is members are assigned by political parties. Um, how it works is representatives or senators will actually request membership. And then the chairperson of that committee, as well as the leadership of that political party, will determine um, who they want. And a chairperson is, is very powerful in their role as a head of a committee because they can determine who goes where and, and who gets what, and because they not only decide who's on the committee, um, but they manage the entire um, committee in itself, what they're going to talk about, what um, what staff's going to be there, um, how they're going to debate, and so forth. So a uh, chairperson's role in a committee is very, very powerful. It gives them kind of a, it's another um, ladder, or another rung on the ladder of the power structure within Congress, even though they're typic they're supposed to be even. They're going to have power over other members. Um, now, it's an unwritten rule that um, chairpersons are selected by seniority. Um, you're going to see this in a lot of jobs across the country. Uh, people get promoted or moved up just based on seniority, not necessarily based on skill, which is why it um, can be a highly criticized system um, for our Congress, as well as for many other um, avenues of, of work across the country, across the world. Um, but generally, the person that has served the longest time is, is given the first option to be a chairperson um, for a committee. All right, so let's move on to the actual staff and support agencies of our Congress. And you can see the lovely Capitol building where the House and Senate reside. All right, so um, really over the years, um, in the last hundred years or so, uh, our Congress has changed. Um, about a hundred years ago, congressmen didn't really have a staff, and if they did, it was maybe one person, two people at most, and it was personally theirs. Um, but as our government has been reorganized, has grown um, over the last hundred years, um, we've seen a growing staffing of, member of st members of staff on our um, individual representatives and senators. And it has to do with a lot of reasons. I mean, just the fact that we're dealing with so many more issues, um, not only across the states, across the country, but across the world, it's led to that. And the fact that our government's grown so much in terms of its um, its uh, number of programs and policies and, and offices, it, you, you, we've needed that. Now the role of, of the staff is to not only, is to really help our senators and representatives in every way possible. Um, they communicate with voters. They communicate with other members of Congress. They they write bills. They write reports. They they do research. Whatever um, they're asked to do, they do. So there's a couple types of staff. There's personal staff and committee staff. So let's talk about personal staff first. Um, the personal staff is, is there to serve the individual congressman or woman. Um, and the size of that staff is dependent on the budget that that individual congressperson has. Um, now, there are three types of staff that are part of the personal staff. You have administrative assistance, which if you see the picture there of the woman with all the arms, that's exactly what an administrative assistant does. They run the office, they supervise the schedule, they provide advice, 
Um, they may even write bills on occasion. They pretty much do everything that that staff or every everything that that member of Congress needs them to do um, so that they get where they need to go and do what they need to do. Um, the next type of worker uh, workers are the legislative assistants and caseworkers. Um, so legislative assistants are more focused on assisting congressmen and women in the office while they're working on bills um, or being in committees. Um, they're researchers, they're writers, they're, they're um, writers of bills and, and so forth. So they are really focused on the helping that congressman or woman draft um, bills and get them presented or working on um, legislative um, work. And they're mostly lost former former college students that are, have been through law school. Um, then you have caseworkers. Now, typically, caseworkers are, are, are mostly the personal staff that's going to be at home, um, not in the offices in D.C. They're going to be back in that home state or the home district for that person. And they're going to be handling requests from the local um, state or district area. All right, so the support agencies um, for Congress are support agencies that help other branches of government as well as the, us, the public can actually go specifically to the Library of Congress and get access to. So the Library of Congress is, is the foremost um, support agency for research for Congress. They have the Congressional Research Center or service there that allows gives them access to research um, and um, places to answer requests for in information, which is very, very important because they're going to be looking through laws and looking at details and, and all different sorts of things. Um, and this is a place you go. It is one of the largest libraries in the world, um, if not the largest library in the world, depending on what type of source you're looking at. Um, it ranks right up there. Um, it, I think it's actually in a fight with um, Michigan State's main library in terms of number of uh, sources and stuff, depending on what type of so what you consider a source in, in place. Um, the next is the CDO. It's the Congressional Budget Office. Is the name just pretty much tells you what it does. It coordinates the budget of Congress, um, studies their budget proposals, and makes projections. Now, this is important not just for Congress, but this is also important for the executive branch because one of the most important jobs of our president and Congress to get Congress in terms of working together is to construct a budget. So this is a really important office in terms of working with those two those two branches. All right, I believe this is the last one. Yep. So the last two supporting agencies are the General Accounting Office, um, which is they essentially they're accountants. So they literally just look at okay, where is money going? How is it being appropriated? And then when the those different agencies, different groups, or diff, different actions within our government, um, when they get that appropriated money, how is it being how is it being spended? And then they look at it and say, okay, this is being done right. This isn't and so forth. Then they review all the financial statements of our government to make sure that the money is going where it needs to go and being spent on what it needs to be spent on. And then the last one is, the name gives it away. It's the government printing office. This is, every branch of government uses this, um, and it does all the printing for the federal government. And this is important because it, not only is it there for them, it gives them a single place to go, but it allows them to be able to produce um, the information they need to show when they're talking about critical issues or critical bills or actions um, on the floor of the House of Representatives or the Senate. And it gives them, say, hey, I need to have a graph printed to show you, look, this is this is what's going on. Um, we're seeing this increased amount of spending or this decrease in, in the economy or um, in for current events sake, we're seeing that a rise in number of jobless rate because of the coronavirus um, layoffs or so forth there they would go in and have these things printed there um, as for um, that um, we've come to an end talking about um, the committees and the staff I hope you guys enjoyed this if you have any questions please let me know and have a great day